thank you very much, uh, Alex. Thank you very much uh, to the AEI for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the colleagues on, on the panel for um, their participation as well. Look, I should firstly perhaps issue a sort of standard health warning. Uh, I'm, I represent the European Union, I do not speak on behalf of the British government and I cannot speak to the uh, intentions of the British government or the consequences of, of their election for, for obvious reasons, but um, I will pick up some of the points maybe that John made a little later, you may not be surprised to hear that. Um, but let's just deal with what we know. Uh, what we know is that uh, uh, on the 23rd of June, Britain held a consultative referendum about whether they wished to leave or remain in the European Union. Uh, by 52% to 48%, they voted to uh, leave. Um, by the way, they voted to leave a union which they had voluntarily joined, uh, which I think is somewhat different from the situation of the Declaration of Independence, um, uh, and a union on which they had already held a referendum in 1975 to further consolidate that decision as to whether they would join, um, and which always contained the possibility of leaving. Uh, so we're such a such a, a, a rigid union. We don't even allow. We, we actually allow the possibility that people might actually want to leave. Something that uh, you don't actually allow under your own constitution, as I understand. You may have even had some difficulties of a local nature uh, in the 19th century over that subject. Um, so they are perfectly entitled under Article 50 to say that they wish to leave. We deeply regret that. I'll come back to that maybe a little later. Uh, I say that as someone who's been involved with the European project for most of my career. Um, and particularly as an Irishman, because I think that it has huge consequences for the relationship between the United Kingdom and Ireland, between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And I regret that in, in many of the debates in the UK, perhaps those consequences were not fully integrated into the discussion. It tended to be a very inward looking discussion, but I understand that. We respect the decision. We're saddened by it. I think uh, it's, a, it's a blow for the EU that the UK decides to leave. Um, uh, I think it's the wrong decision for them, but they're perfectly entitled to make it and they will go their own way. And we have a very clearly established procedure by which we now go forward, which is a two-year period over which we negotiate the departure of the United Kingdom from the EU. That bit is actually not that difficult. I mean, you essentially airbrush the UK out of the European treaties. Uh, but as people are realizing, uh, 44 years of deep in involvement with the European Union has meant deep, deep ties between the United Kingdom and uh, the 27 other member states, uh, covering a range of areas that people are only beginning to sort of still understand the full implications of this, going from, you know, supplies for nuclear power plants to aviation uh, agreements to uh, uh, the complexity of regulatory management of pharmaceutical products uh, and so forth. And uh, every day, frankly, uh, in the course of going through this, our teams discover a further complexity that needs to be one way or another sorted out. Uh, the European Union, I think, has been extremely transparent. We've appointed a chief, chief negotiator. The Council has adopted negotiating guidelines. These are publicly available and we have committed to putting all our uh, uh, papers on this issue uh, on the net uh, and making it fully available in a very transparent way. Um, I want to correct one thing, and I think it's extremely important. There is nothing punitive in the approach of the European Union to this process. This is not something that the EU is doing to the UK. This is something that the UK has chosen to do to itself and to the rest of the EU. They have opted to leave. Uh, we therefore have to deal with what the consequences of that are. And I think it would be extremely naive to imagine that you can be part of the largest single market in the world, the, the biggest trading bloc in the world, one of the richest uh, and most successful peace projects in the history of mankind, and that you can walk out the door with no consequences or that you can walk out the door and carry on as though you were still a member. There is a difference between being a member of the European Union and not being a member of the European Union. That is why we have so many people queuing up to want to join the European Union. And getting into the European Union is actually quite a complicated and difficult process uh, where we have rather demanding uh, uh, um, positions which we expect of, of countries that would eventually want to join. So leaving has consequences. And I think this was always made clear to the United Kingdom, and it will have consequences. Now, the process which has been set out over the two years is firstly uh, to deal with a number of upfront issues, uh, which cover firstly the issue of the rights of uh, EU citizens living in the UK and UK citizens living in the rest of Europe. 
because we've had effectively a more or less seamless uh, movement of people across Europe uh, and there will be consequences uh, when the UK leaves and we would like to understand what those consequences will be and how we provide guarantees for those people who moved in good faith with their families, with their jobs uh, and how they are going to, to, to be treated uh, in the post-Brexit world. Uh, secondly, there is the issue of financial responsibilities. Uh, we have a, a multi-annual budget process in the European Union. Our budget is relatively modest. It's only 1% of the GDP of the European Union. But still, we fund important projects, many of which are agreed over a seven to 10 year uh, period. Uh, we need to understand uh, how those financial commitments will be maintained post-Brexit because the UK signed up to those, to that, those finances and that money, uh, and we need to understand how we, will, how we will deal with that going forward. And the other issue, of course, is the issue of frontiers, uh, particularly between Northern Ireland and Ireland, uh, but there are other frontier issues as well. So those are three issues which we believe need to be addressed uh, early on in the negotiations. In a second phase, we should look at what the new relationship would be. Uh, there are a number of options that one could imagine. I think Paul Simon said there are 50 ways to leave your lover. I don't know if there are 50 ways to, to Brexit, but uh, there are certainly a number of, 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 of forms of Brexit which you could imagine. What we understand from what has been said by the UK until now, they, they envisage uh, a fairly strict form of Brexit, which is leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, and they would wish to renegotiate the trade relationship with the EU via a comprehensive free trade agreement. Fine. Uh, if that is the wish, that is going to take many, many years to negotiate. Uh, I'm a veteran trade negotiator. Uh, I negotiated the EU-South Korea trade agreement in two and a half years, but I can tell you we did that on the back of an excellent template already agreed between the US negotiators and my South Korean counterparts. Uh, most trade agreements of a comprehensive nature take longer. We've just concluded uh, and will enter into force uh, on the 21st of September a very comprehensive, probably one of the most comprehensive trade agreements ever agreed between uh, industrialized countries uh, with Canada, and that took nearly eight years. And that was between two very like-minded partners. Uh, we are about to conclude uh, with Japan, and that took uh, probably about six, six to seven years. And by the time it's finally ratified and signed and done and dusted, it'll probably be closer to, to seven or eight years as well. That's the kind of time frame a comprehensive trade deal takes. Uh, and you cannot simply replicate the seamless membership of the single market, which comes with membership of the European Union, where everything is governed by single sets of European regulations, which you don't require a trade negotiations, and that's precisely why we have the European Union. So it's not bilateral trade deals. It is the creation of a single economic and commercial space. Uh, you cannot reproduce that in a trade deal uh, very easily. You can't simply cut and paste uh, what's in the treaties and put them into a trade negotiation. It, won't, it doesn't work like that. So we know that's going to take a number of years, and that brings me to the third phase of the negotiation, which is going to be some form of transition. Again, we don't know what the UK precisely wishes for this transition. It will be very much for them to say uh, what kind of transition they would like to see between the moment they will leave, which is fixed as the two years after the 29th of March uh, 2017, so the 29th of March 2019, uh, they will exit. Uh, it'll take us, you know, certainly five, six years to negotiate a comprehensive trade deal. What do we do in the meantime? And how do we manage the multiple, multiple complexities that would result from the UK crashing out of the, of the single market and uh, the, the uh, European Union uh, on the, the 30th of March 2019? There needs to be some kind of transition. Again, we wait to see what it is that the UK wants. Again, there are many different formulae. There's the, uh, the Norway uh, European Economic Area formula. There's the Swiss formula. There are different ways we can look at this, but we do need to find some solution uh, to this transitional issue. And so this, this is where we are. Uh, I want to emphasize that there is absolutely no sense of punishment or no sense of vindictiveness. We are uh, disappointed the UK is leaving. We want a good relationship with the UK. We want a good trading relationship. We want a good security and defense relationship and counterterrorism relationship. But all of this is going to be infinitely more complicated to manage than it was when the UK was an integral part of the European Union. That's a fact. That is why we're in the European Union. That is why we have invested in building this remarkable project. And what I would just like to emphasize is that for the rest of us, the 27, uh, we are going to continue with this process. And I frankly, John, uh, vigorously reject your vision of the European Union. And I say that as a, as, a, as a European citizen and as someone who has seen what the European Union has done for my continent. 
The European Union is a fundamentally a project of peace, freedom, and prosperity. I don't deny that other factors may have contributed to peace in Europe, uh, including NATO, including the uh, transatlantic, I don't deny that. But the fact is the reconciliation between the warring factions of the first half of the 20th century was largely a process of the European Union and what we built together. And I say that as an Irishman because I believe that the peace process in Northern Ireland was largely a product of joint membership of the European Union by the United Kingdom and, and, and the Republic of Ireland. We were able to build a, a new reality on the island of Ireland which recognized the rights of the Unionists to guarantee to live within the United Kingdom without, unless there was a change by the majority. At the same time, the fact that the border in practice no longer existed because we were both part of the European Union, the nationalists could feel they were living on a single island and we squared the impossible circle which had led to uh, unconscionable violence and atrocities over 30 years. It's just one illustration. The fact is we've had 70 years of peace on the European continent. You have to go back to the 16th century to find a, 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 an equivalent period of, of no conflict between the major powers. And that is in large measure a contribution of the European Union. We have built freedom. The European Union has guaranteed the values of democracy, of human rights, uh, uh, and the rule of law. We provided a shelter for Greece when they emerged from the dictatorship of the colonels, for Spain and Portugal, from Franco and Salazar. And after the collapse of communism, we provided a, a magnetic north and a safe haven for the emerging uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe. I don't think that the European Union can claim credit for the fall of the Berlin Wall. I do believe that we can take credit for the fact that the fall of the Berlin Wall did not result in chaos and violence and confusion, but rather the orderly transition to the uh, vibrant democracies that we now see as members of the European Union. And finally, prosperity, because yes, there is no country in the European Union that is not better off today than it was when it joined the European Union. I can say that for my own country, I can say that for uh, even a country like Greece, which is suffering a uh, huge hardship at the present time because of the economic difficulties that we all know, but the fact is Greece is an infinitely different place. I was just there recently, uh, and I can tell you I used to visit Greece in the early 70s. Uh, there's no comparison, even Greece suffering and having its economic difficulties. And the same is true for every country in Europe. You look at somewhere like Poland and compare its position now to, say, Ukraine and you can compare the trajectory of countries which have joined the European Union and those which have not. So I absolutely think that the European Union has been a vastly successful project. The 27 will continue. It is not about abolishing the member state. It is not about abolishing national, national interest or national nationality. It is the squaring of that circle, the reconciliation of multiple layers of identity. I'm from Dublin, I'm Irish, I'm European. There's no contradiction between these different levels of, of identity. But I know that Ireland on its own cannot manage in this 21st century. Not even a country like Germany can manage on its own in the 21st century. We will be stronger and more effective when we pool sovereignty and work together in the interests of our people. We will still, the most things that you want to do in your country will be decided at the national level. Your healthcare system, your education system, uh, your economic system. Look at the difference between the economies of our countries across the 27 member states. Countries which are highly deregulated, countries which have high tax systems and countries which have low tax systems. There is no uniformity here. There is no imposition of a single model. People continue to have their national identity, but we do that in a world which is vastly different in the 21st century to that which we lived through in the first half of the 20th century with two world wars and the Holocaust at our responsibility. So we will continue on that direction. We will continue to develop and grow. We will try to have the best possible relationship with the United Kingdom, uh, but that will also depend in large measure on what exactly the United Kingdom wants for itself in a post-Brexit future. And I notice that there's a, a continuing debate in the UK about how that's going to look, and we will respectfully wait for them to let us know how they want to take this relationship forward. There will be no punishment, but there is a difference between being a member of the European Union and being outside of the European Union. And that is what we will have to deal with. Thank you.